I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. Ms. Randy Levinas is the Executive Vice President of the U.S.-Russia Business Council. Jeff Kim is the Chief Operating Officer of CD Networks, Americas, and EMEA. Now that we have covered the introductions, I would like to hand the presentation to our first speaker of the day, Ms. Randy Levinas. I'd also like to just take a minute to cover the agenda, which is the Russia Global Business Overview. After that, we will cover Russia Online Overview, Russia's Online Performance Challenges, Russia Acceleration, a case study review, and some key learnings. Thank you, Randy. You may begin. Thank you, Karina. We're delighted to be partnering today with CD Networks um, to bring you an overview of the Russian market, mostly a macro view, but also a bit of microdata, to be a scene setter for Jeff Kim, who has the expertise on Russia's internet challenges and can offer some solutions to those. Now, the USRBC is a trade association in our 21st year. We're a nonprofit organization, and we represent the interests of our 240 member companies. We provide advocacy, access to high level officials, networking opportunities, information services, and more. Our aim is to increase trade and investment between the United States and Russia, enhance the overall relationship through commerce, and hopefully promote greater understanding along the way. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we have an office in Moscow. Now, everyone knows that Russia is one of the BRIC emerging markets, but for a variety of historical reasons here in the United States, for many, Russia is not at the top of companies' emerging markets list for expansion and growth. And that could be a gross oversight. Because you can look across a spectrum of industries where businesses and investors find Russia attractive for a number of reasons. The most obvious is its abundance of natural resources. It's got the world's largest natural gas reserves, the eighth largest proven oil reserves, and significant metal deposits. The list goes from steel, platinum, iron, coal, gold, uranium, on and on. Secondly, location, location, location. Geographically, Russia is ideally situated between Europe and the East. It makes it an important transit card or potentially, and it could eventually become an important link in a global manufacturing supply chain. Russia also has good macroeconomic fundamentals. They've gone through a decade of fiscal and monetary discipline, and they've created a significant cushion for future so shocks. Um, capitalizing on natural resource strengths, specifically in energy, Russia has prudently channeled funds from its energy winnings into a rainy day fund, its stabilization fund, which currently has about $170 billion. It's also got the world's third largest foreign exchange reserves. And over the next few years, we expect 35 to 4% GDP growth in Russia. It also has low sovereign, sovereign debt, 10% of GDP, which is significantly lower than its BRIC counterparts. China has 21%, Brazil has 35%, and India has 66%. Russia also has a strong tradition in the applied sciences and mathematics. Many Western technology firms continue to locate R&D facilities in Russia for this reason. And we'll talk about one specific high-profile project a bit later. But Russia is also home to 140 million consumers with a growing, highly educated middle class that has developed a preference for high-quality Western goods and services. That middle class is also not highly leveraged. Finally, Russia joined the WTO in August 2012. Now, why is that significant? The WTO is the club on global trade rules. Members pledge to abide by those rules, and they're expected to abide by them. This rule, these rules range from limits for uh, limiting tariffs to notification of new regulations, restraints on government requirements for investment, to technical rules for product standards that can't be more trade restrictive than necessary, and the list goes on. But the essential benefit, I think, that put, is that WTO membership puts sunshine on a system that's sorely in need of greater transparency and greater certainty for business. And for anyone who works in Russia, you know it can be a particularly black box. 
Now, Russia is the eighth largest economy in the world, and it's a geographically vast market. It spans nine time zones and encompasses more than 17 million square miles. As my friends at Caterpillar like to say, that's a lot of dirt. And as many of our members say, Russia is simply too large to ignore. But it's useful to take a closer look at Russia's labor force. It's the seventh largest in the world. And last year, Russia actually ranked number two in Europe in terms of job creation. Now, that could be a picture of Europe as much as it is of Russia today, but we definitely do see strength in the Russian market, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of some of the market fundamentals. Now, how are those workers split across the economy? In Russia, services are the biggest sector of the economy. The services actually accounts for 58% of Russia's GDP. And Russia employs 65% of its labor force in services. Now, they're located primarily in wholesale and retail trade, followed closely by public administration, then health, and then education. But services is not yet an area in which Russia is particularly competitive globally. Now, after services, the next largest segment of Russians are employed in the industrial sector, 27%. And employment in agriculture accounts for 8% of the country's workers. Unemployment in Russia is currently an enviable 5.4%. Russia's labor productivity is currently only 36% of that in the United States. So there's still some gains to be made from improvements there. If we take another measure of the market dynamics in Russia, you can see that jobs created by FDI projects increased by 60% in 2012. And it's important to note that Moscow and St. Petersburg are particularly hot spots for technology investment. Also, Russia has the highest GDP per capita of the BRIC countries. As you can see here, Russia clocks in at a strong $14,300 per capita compared to $1,500 for India. Now, we've noted before that Moscow and St. Petersburg are hot spots for technology investments. Firms have located R&D centers there, drawing from strong university talent and urban internet savvy populations. But as Moscow and St. Petersburg have become saturated, we've been seeing more and more companies looking to the regions to find new markets. Several of Russia's regions have taken a proactive approach and are successfully marketing themselves to foreign investors. They're undertaking legislative and tax initiatives to make their regions more attractive. What we have on this slide, not an overly scientific sample, but it's a good representative sample of those regions among Russia's 83 that we have seen as particularly active in courting foreign investment, particularly with respect to the United States. You can see here that none of them have populations less than 1 million. Now, we're showing regions here, but I'd point out that based on Russia's 2010 census, there are 15 cities in Russia that have populations with 1 million people or more. So back to these regions, you can see the variety of industries that are predominant in each of the six listed. That doesn't mean that each of them is not seriously courting a more diversified investment base. And also, I'd point out that some of them are hosts to special economic zones, such as Stavropol, Tatarstan, and Ulyanovsk. As anywhere in the world, SEZs provide special tax and other incentives to attract investors. I would note that there are significant U.S. investments already in each of these regions. To name a few, in Tatarstan, U.S. RBC member Ford Motor Company is a resident of the Alubaga, I'm sorry, Alubuga Special Economic Zone, where it has a manufacturing joint venture with Russian car company Solars. Case New Holland and Cummins also have facilities in Tatarstan. And Chevron has a research JV with a local university there. Our member PepsiCo has a facility in Kaluga. And in Rostov, U.S. RBC members Alcoa, Cargo, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, DuPont, and Guardian all have production facilities. Now let's look at a shift that is an emphasis that's going on in Russia's economy. In recent years, the Russian government has talked a lot about modernizing the economy and diversifying away from reliance on oil and gas. At present, 
about 65% of export earnings, 50% of budget revenue, and 25% of GDP come from oil and gas. But one of the most visible efforts to shift Russia's reliance away from oil and gas and to take advantage of its raw math and scientific talent and to spur innovation and growth in the economy has been the effort to create what Russia refers to and others refer to as Russia's own Silicon Valley close to Moscow. It's known as the Skolkovo Innovation City or Inograd. And it deserves particular attention, not only because of the hype around it, but because of the level of attention foreign companies are putting there. And I don't think we can ignore the proven model that clusters or ecosystems with the right ingredients can produce results. And that seems to be Russia's goal with Skolkovo. At Skolkovo, they're focusing on five separate areas of innovative technologies, IT, energy efficiency, nuclear, biomedical, and space and telecom. It's to have its own legal, regulatory tax, and customs regime. And in fact, a few weeks ago, Russian Customs issued an order for goods entering Skolkovo to be given preferential customs treatment. It also has its own graduate inst research institute, Skoltech, with graduate degrees taught in English only, which is a, 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 a partnership with MIT. And some major U.S. companies that have signed on to Skolkovo include Boeing, Cisco, Dow, General Electric, Johnson & Johnson, and Microsoft. It's interesting to note that last year, 25% of all patents developed in Russia came out of Skolkovo. 500 startup firms are signed up as residents there, and 100 have already received funding. Of course, Russia does also have five federal technology SEZs and a number of regional techno parks, each with their own special tax, customs, and regulatory regimes. Now, there are broader issues confronting Russia's innovation agenda, and these are challenges related to IP protection, access to venture capital, and cultural issues associated with risk aversion, legal complications regarding bankruptcy, which has been considered a criminal offense. So, for example, the concept of borrowing money from someone that's not a relative, no less, for a new venture with the possibility that they might not be able to pay it back has not fully taken hold in Russia. But we do have to recognize that Russia is moving forward. May, they, we may, they may not be where we want them to be on IP protection, for example, but there have been advances in that area. It's also important to note that Russia was declared the 14th most innovative country in the world earlier this year by Bloomberg News, beating out Israel, for example. And the determinant factors for this ranking are related to Russia's strong performance on items such as R&D intensity, high-tech density, patent activity, researcher concentration, and the degree of students in higher education. Russia did less well on productivity, as we've noted before, and manufacturing capability. So that's a good macro overview of Russia from the inside. Let's see what Russia looks like in terms of trade relations with the rest of the world. So we'll focus here on the first half 2013 data which is pretty representative of what's been going on in other years. So it's easy to see here that represented by the light blue, the EU is Russia's largest trading partner, accounting for 41.6% of its imports in the first half of the year. Essentially, the EU is light years ahead of the rest of the pack if you go clockwise around the, the pie chart. So you can see China took number two slot, 16.3% of Russia's imports accounting for that, Ukraine trailed in third place with 5.2%, Belarus had 5%, and the U.S. came in at number five. We accounted for 3.5% of Russia's imports in the first half of the year. But it's also important to understand Russia's import profile in terms of what goods they're buying. Number one was machinery, two vehicles, three pharmaceuticals, four plastics, five semi-finished metals, six agricultural products, seven science and medical instruments, and eight iron and steel. So given this import profile and given Russia's preference for high quality goods and the U.S. strength in services, 
you begin to see why here at USRBC we believe there's plenty of room for U.S. companies to grow their profile in the Russian market. So now we can look a little bit more closely at our bilateral relationship in terms of trade. Russia was the 31st largest export market for the United States in 2012 in goods. They accounted for 1.1% of total U.S. trade. That was our 20th largest trading partner overall. But we expect to see even greater export growth over the coming years as a result of Russia's W2 accession for the reasons I outlined earlier. The Peterson Institute has estimated that U.S. exports to Russia could double over the next five years with the WTO membership. Now, in 2012, what you're seeing is a, a, t a record year for exports to Russia. We clocked in at $10.7 billion, a 29% increase over 2011 levels. Now, it's interesting that even in the first half of 2013, our exports to Russia increased another 4%. So really, we're maintaining that momentum. Our top exports are, first of all, transportation equipment, followed by machinery, then chemicals, and then computers and electronics. And just to note the, the, the patterns in, in 2013, the increases that we're seeing in part are due to increases in computer and electronic products, a $14 million increase, and also a $25 million increase in electrical equipment, appliances, and components. Now I'd like to shift focus and go a bit more mac micro and share with you some specific information on Russian consumers and their spending patterns. Russians are about half as active in the financial markets as Europeans. And many reasons are given, ranging from consumers' lack of trust in the Russian financial system to low average income, which leaves little room for investment. But we should note that Russian household debt is only around 10% of GDP compared to 30% for many emerging market peers. So there is room for consumer loan and credit card growth, and we're already seeing a shift. This chart shows the growth in credit and debit card usage in Russia between 2007 and 2012. You can see that in 2007, Russians were using 91 million debit cards and 12 million credit cards. Five years later, at the end of 2012, Russia had 137 million debit cards and 54 million credit cards in use. Clearly, credit card use is growing exponentially. Nevertheless, despite the fact that the credit card use, usage has grown by 350%, only about 40% of Russians hold credit cards today. Now, here's some more interesting data on Russian consumers. Earlier this year, the New York Times reported that Russians now spend 60% of their pre-tax in tax income shopping. And now that's the highest percentage in all of Europe. Russians also have seen steadily growing wages real wages, and real disposable incomes. So whereas only 10% of Russia's population earned more than $500 in monthly income in 2004, by 2010 that percentage jumped to about 50% of the population. And according to a study by Ernst & Young, the average Muscovite has more disposable income than the average Houston resident. So I think you should join us at our annual meeting in Houston in October and at any of our events in Moscow, and you can compare that for yourself. But most likely, this is all possible because many Russians pay no rent or house payments. And after the privatization of state-owned Soviet, Soviet housing, you know, Russians have no more mortgages. Most Russians have no mortgages. Okay, so here we feature the words of Russia's President Vladimir Putin. And we went through a number of quotes, but we felt it was best here to reflect a message from Russia's top leader. And here he says, Russia's top priority is to create the conditions for sustained economic growth. What also accompanied this message by Mr. Putin at Russia's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum this year, where he made this comment, was a recognition that Russia is facing an era when its reliance on high oil prices cannot continue. He also said, there are no simple solutions and no magic wand we can wave to change things overnight. 
economic growth must be based, based sorry, on three pillars, increased labor productivity, investment, and innovation. He said, progress in all of these areas can be achieved only by bringing down financial, management, and infrastructure costs, developing human capital, and creating a genuinely competitive environment for doing business. So we'll take that sentiment, and it's our commitment to work with companies inside and outside of Russia and both of our governments to achieve it. The overall thoughts we want to leave you with today is that, first of all, Russia has great potential for growth. We need to recognize it's a high-risk, high-reward place to do business, however. Our members are reporting double-digit growth in the market and strong profitability, but they're also committed to the long term. Now, despite the slowdown in the first half of this year, as we noted earlier, there's consensus that the economy is going to pick up in the second half of 2012, where they're forecasting a 2.4% growth on GDP for this year overall, and we've already mentioned the 35 to 4% growth in 2014. Given Russia's wealth of talent in science, engineering, and mathematics, as well as the fast-growing consumer class and abundance of natural resources, Russia is well positioned to become a leader in global economic development. Infrastructure development, a very important area for Russia's growth, could unlock regional markets in the future, and we're already beginning to see some of that. But as with other emerging economies, it's going to be important for Russia's leaders to tackle some of the systemic challenges facing the economy, increasing transparency, encouraging good corporate governance, and reducing corruption and red tape in order for Russia to reach its full potential. So thank you very much. That concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm happy to take your questions at the end of Jeff Kim's presentation. Thank you, Randy. That's, uh, that was actually uh, a wealth of information. I actually learned quite a bit. Let's, for the next segment of the presentation, we'll, we're going to dive specifically into Russia's Internet landscape and uh, dive a little bit more into the, the network and the, the technology. So a bit about CD networks. So we are a global cloud acceleration network. Um, so put simply, uh, customers, we, we make websites, web applications, client server applications run faster over, over the web. And so our mission um, out there is to transform the Internet into employees around, around the globe. Um, we work with our customers and partners to uh, accelerate their uh, websites, web applications in their local markets, be it in uh, the U.S. or London or Paris, but we're foremost experts in, ex in extending uh, their sites, their bu web businesses into global markets, uh, into uh, the tough-to-reach areas like uh, China, the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia, and, uh, and of course, Russia, which is the context uh, of this uh, presentation. Uh, a bit more about us, we have 140 points of presence throughout the globe. So these are our hardware, our software, uh, uh, networks throughout the cities in, in, in over 80 cities. We specifically have 13 points of presence uh, within Russia, and we'll talk a, a lot more about, about that and what we do with that. We have global partnerships with uh, some of the largest uh, uh, telco network Internet providers out there, including Megaphone, which is a large mobile telecom provider in, in Russia, as well as KDDI Telehealth. Um, and uh, we recently announced a partnership with SAP, um, you know, through, uh, to extend their applications throughout the globe as well. So uh, th this is actually a, a kind of an eye chart on specific POPs and cities. Um, we have uh, a, a larger picture on our website, cdnetworks.com, that you can view. Um, but we will focus specifically on, on, uh, on Russia uh, th through this presentation. So a bit more about uh, the Internet um, and, uh, and online. So, the, the Russian Internet is called the Runet um, within, within the country, um, and augmenting some of the facts that uh, Randy provided, um, it's, the Runet is very active. Um, we have 67 million Internet users and growing on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter yearly to year basis. Uh, only half of the adult population is connected today, so there's still a lot of room for growth. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this actually surprised me, uh, the Russian language is the second most used language on the web. 80% um, uh, of online purchases are made through couponing websites, um, 
And in 2012, which uh, uh, Russia became the largest online market in Europe. So a very, uh, in a very short period of time, has grown significantly as one of the, the largest web markets in the world, um, uh, even with all the challenges that we'll kind of describe through the, through the next few slides. Um, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of uh, non-Russia Runet Internet uh, folks, when they think of uh, expanding into Russia, they think of, okay, let me put up a, a point of presence or an application in Moscow or St. Petersburg, and that should do it. Unfortunately, this, uh, if you look at this graph, only 15% of the Internet population are, are, are within uh, those two particular cities. Russia covers nine time zones. It's a huge territory, and there are millions of people spread out throughout, uh, throughout the region, um, throughout all of Russia. So unlike, let's say, the United States where you put a point of presence in New York and um, because it, you know, New York to the West Coast is about 50 milliseconds and connectivity is excellent, that will do. Well, putting a, a single application, whether it's a, you know, a website or an SAP application or a learning management system in Moscow, um, will not do when uh, the, the entire territory has you know, is 100 milliseconds and, and uh, many different miles uh, away. So, uh, this is a very interesting graph to show how, how dispersed your, your audience really is. So let's dive specifically into the, the challenges, the, the Internet and online challenges in Russia. Uh, first and foremost are our payments. So uh, this the kind of uh, uh, paying for e-commerce, for retail, it's still in, in its infancy. So the vast majority of, of, of uh, payments are still done through ki uh, cash kiosks. So um, you can go onto websites and make a purchase, and you still have to go out physically to a kiosk and deposit cash to, to complete the transaction. So if you want to get started now, um, you know, partnering up with these different vendors and partners in the payment system um, uh, is the right way to go. However, I will say that our friends at Visa, MasterCard, PayPal are making hundreds of millions of dollars of investments um, in, into the Russian market to get um, you know, digital wallets, digital payments. Um, and in fact, they see this as a, a leapfrogging opportunity where um, you know, uh, plastic credit cards, uh, you know, it, it may be left behind for the, for the, more, the more digital um, uh, mechanisms out there. So it's a very interesting uh, space um, to be in for this, for, for this payment uh, sector. Um, Russia always also has its own version of a firewall. So everyone knows of the, of the great Chinese firewall, um, which we've covered uh, in previous webcasts, but Russia also has its own type of firewall. And some of it is very straightforward. There are, the, there are different anti-piracy law that actually just went into effect. There's a uh, uh, blacklisting bill that went into effect last year, and these are things like uh, illegal downloads of content and pirated uh, movies and whatnot getting shut down, as well as, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, illicit drug or, or uh, uh, child pornography or illegal content, hate language, anything like that getting uh, uh, pulled down. Uh, as well as the last type, illegal content. So um, gambling uh, websites as well as gambling informational websites just started getting blocked. So that, uh, you, know, you know, that was a recent event, and that this continues, this firewall um, kind of uh, ecosystem continues to evolve. Um, and so you, you actually do need feet and knowledge, uh, uh, wisdom on the street to, to figure out how to navigate around these or how to uh, adjust your uh, web businesses to, to meet the uh, uh, evolving landscape on this, in this space. Finally, um, also is, the, is internet performance and, and availability. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, uh, the internet within uh, or the runet within Russia um, is still maturing. So I would say um, how the internet was in the United States or in the European uh, Western European regions about a decade ago is where the inter uh, Russian internet is, but it's ra uh, continuing to evolve rapidly. So this weird-looking graph at the bottom is actually um, a a packet loss chart, and so there are cities on the bottom that represent uh, uh, points of presence within Russia, um, and then international uh, cities on the right-hand side. 
And on this particular graph was taken on a particularly bad day, and we were measuring uh, packet loss between uh, these Russian points of present cities and international cities. Um, and you, you can see that uh, there are, uh, there's packet loss all the way between 1% and 10%. So um, this packet loss basically means when um, Internet traffic gets lost along the way. Uh, through routers or uh, connectivity problems or, or things like that. That, relatively speaking, in the U.S., if uh, our internet receives uh, sees one percent packet loss, then it's a particularly bad day, and all sorts of uh, IT people get uh, blamed and yelled at. But in Russia, uh, two, three, four, even ten percent packet loss is quite common, and so you, we need the ability to be able to route around issues and the intelligence to know uh, when things are going on. Um, so uh, monitoring and then rerouting of, of uh, traffic is very important uh, there. But I will say again, it's getting better and better every quarter, every year, um, and uh, Russia is rapidly expanding. Okay, so let's dive specifically into the challenges that uh, a lot of our customers face. Um, when they, let's say, have an application hosted in, in this example, in San Jose. And um, uh, performance is fine going to the United States and even particularly okay to going into, let's say, Europe. But, uh, you know, uh, when, they, when end users in Russia try to access a site, it literally can take 30, 40 seconds for a website or web application to load, which is completely unusable. The, the key challenge is in uh, this... Uh, it goes for Russia as well as the general Internet uh, uh, itself. First is, um, and these are quite technical, so I won't go into the specific details, is our Internet uh, latency. We still have a speed of light problem. Um, we haven't solved that yet, of course, and probably won't in the, in the near time. But let's say in this particular example, San Jose to New York is about 50 milliseconds. Um, San Jose to London is about 150 milliseconds, and uh, San Jose actually to one of the regional cities in Moscow, uh, not Shanghai in this particular example, is probably about three or 400 milliseconds. Um, that's for one packet to, to uh, traverse uh, the Internet. Um, you'll obviously know that, uh, you know, um, with a single website or web page, you have, you know, 50, 60 different objects uh, that are getting, getting passed back and forth. Secondly, our network problems. Any time that uh, there's packet loss or something get, uh, goes along, along the path of, of the way, which is, again, quite common in Russia, you have to retransmit all that data, uh, which, again, further uh, uh, decreases performance of sites. And then, finally, uh, the inefficiency of uh, the underlying protocols of the Internet. So uh, TCP IP, which was actually created uh, in 1973, um, is actually the, still the protocol that we use uh, on the Internet today. That's because all the hardware, all the routers, everything that, all the investments that have been made over the, over the de past few decades um, are based on this technology. Well, uh, unfortunately, this protocol is a very chatty protocol. And the, the diagram here, all the red lines going back and forth are for setting up the, the lines of communication, responding, uh, responding back and forth, and, and the green, green represents the payload. So you're, you're spending a lot of time just um, doing handshakes and hellos and are you still theirs? Um, and uh, uh, only a, a small portion of the time is actually getting your website or your application out to the other end. So what does all this mean? Um, this means, and again, in this example, you have a, an application or website hosted in Washington, D.C. Um, you have sub-second speeds in areas around Washington, Philadelphia, Atlanta, uh, but all the way on the right-hand side, you have, uh, let's say, Moscow, and it's 12 times slower. And this is for a single object. So again, when you multiply, let's just say, 1.2 seconds times, let's say, 30 objects to make up a, a website or a web application, you can easily see how you can get a 30-second uh, uh, time um, for a single page to load. Um, and that's actually what we see when we measure end-user um, performance uh, from uh, from the Russian end users. Okay, um, and as all as many of you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, you know our customers are from uh, you know e uh, retail, e-commerce, uh, luxury brands, uh, fi financial services, 
as well as uh, you know travel and tourism. Speed matters, and so um, you know even in things like uh, SEO or Google ranking, speed matters. Um, uh, you know, a 30-second load time uh, doesn't do anyone any good in terms of your end users as well as your, uh, uh, your rankings. Um, this other thing, specifically on, um, uh, we took sound bites from different uh, sources, show um, that, you know, even, uh, you know, even a, a page re reduction of, you know, Let's see, 400 milliseconds to 900 milliseconds from Google. If something takes that long, uh, we, we see a 25% reduction in traffic. Uh, from Amazon, uh, when a 100 milliseconds of delay reduced revenue by 1%. So you can scour the Internet, and you can actually take a look at these things, as, as well as there's a, a very good study from, from Walmart, actually, that showed that for, for every second uh, of delay, um, they saw a dramatic reduction in click-throughs and and actually purchases. And so um, I'm repeating some things a lot of you already know, but speed matters. Um, and, uh, you know, getting your website, your web, web application uh, fast to uh, your, uh, the Russian population is, is, is important for your web business. Other challenges, security attacks. Um, so these days uh, in the press, there's a lot of news and activity around uh, cybersecurity and DDoS attacks. Um, and so we've, we've actually captured, um, you know, some of the, the headlines from uh, the past few months. And so um, actually the, the Russian Federation is a huge source of a lot of um, the cyber attacks um, uh, because uh, they're – Russia is still, um, you know, going through the uh, growth pains of, uh, of a free market economy and adapting, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, cyber activity comes out of, of that uh, region. Um, it, that, that is an area of concern for a lot of our customers that are trying to extend their businesses there. Are they ready for uh, the large DDoS attacks, or uh, is, there, is their content or application secure enough? Um, this next slide shows some additional details. Um, even a very small or medium-sized business, uh, the average cost of a cyber attack is about $50,000. And for a large business, and uh, you know some of the facts there are that uh, $649,000 for the average cyber attack. Um, so this particular year in, tw in 2013, there's been an increase of activity. Um, in, in some of the boxes there, Q2 of 2013 compared to Q2 of 2012, uh, uh, denial of service attacks um, are up 33% over, over year over year, um, and 23% increase um, uh, in uh, layer three or layer four DDoS attacks. So DDoS attacks for the layman are actually um, when uh, your website or your applications get over flooded or inundated with uh, false or uh, not accurate calls, um, so that uh, uh, the, the traffic is so heavy that your website is unreachable. Um, so imagine that uh, um, you know during your Christmas season or during one of your shopping seasons, if uh, the amount the amount of revenue that you would lose because uh, valid uh, consumers are unable to reach your site. So these days, uh, DDoS attacks are sometimes malicious, sometimes uh, political in statement. Um, there's a lot of activity these days going on. Uh, in this particular space. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive a little bit into CD networks and what we provide, um, particularly in this space. And just for everyone's reference, this is actually a Marusha B2. It's actually a Russian supercar. Um, it goes 420, uh, 420 horsepower, um, 0 to 60 in 3.8 seconds, and it is uh, notable for being the first uh, Russian sports car manufactured, designed, and created in Russia. Um, very cool-looking Batman-like car, I think, it looks like. All right. So, Russian acceleration. What do we do? Um, a lot of our customers, and let me pause for a second to say that um, we are seeing a lot of interest in the Russian market. So, um, as we mentioned, CD Networks, uh, you know, we've been around for 13 years, have been helping people to get into, into all different parts of the world. For a while, a lot of interest was in China. Um, so there was a, a slew of information, uh, folks, uh, 
interest in going, going into China, uh, getting past their firewall, figuring out how to, how to uh, penetrate that area. I'll say over the past year, that same kind of fervent interest in Russia um, has come about um, in all sorts of sectors, uh, financial services uh, specifically uh, a lot. Um, obviously, e-commerce, retail, uh, and luxury brands uh, uh, significant, and then travel and tourism. Um, not to say that uh, there's not other interest in other sectors as well, in, in hardcore uh, business to business like enterprise, uh, uh, like SAP, and, and other kind of uh, uh, core applications. But in these particular sectors, there seems we're seeing a lot of new prospects, customers, um, and uh, you know activity in this space. So it's very positive to see. When they typically come, uh, some of the this is how our customers are addressing this problem. Okay, and these are the different types of solutions that they have. First and foremost, they think of the old IT way of doing things, which is I have a, a data center in London, and I need to get more uh, better access or better performance in, in Russia. So let's set up a, a point of presence in Moscow. And that's they want to spend um, uh, a lot of money, deploy their new application in Moscow, and hopefully that will solve the problem. That does not solve the problem. Um, as we mentioned before, Moscow is not Russia. Um, there is, it's a vast uh, territory. Um, even with our 13 points of presence in Russia, it's, it's just barely enough, and we continue to grow quarter over quarter with new points of presence in Russia just to be able to cover the space. Um, the Internet is improving, but it really is like the Internet a, a decade ago in, in, in the United States. Um, you, we still need to, be, need to be able to route around issues and uh, improve uh, performance in other ways. The second option that they work, uh, our customers or prospects look into is to deploy hardware appliances. So a lot, there are a lot of hardware appliances that will try to accelerate between branch offices. Um, so you can buy these things from uh, Blue Code or Riverbed or Cisco or Juniper and try to uh, you know, put a, a, a hardware box on one end or a, and a hardware box near your origin uh, data center and, and try to accelerate. Unfortunately, this doesn't work either um, just because uh, end users are more and more remote, even your business uh, partners are more and more uh, nomadic and expanding, and uh, you know, uh, hardware isn't the solution as well, and it's very expensive. And then finally, a lot of folks um, work with uh, traditional CDNs. So the content delivery network space has been around for a while. Uh, typically associated with the CDN space is the term is caching, um, being able to cache websites or uh, streaming video or, or things of that nature um, uh, you know, in a CDN's edge location and delivering it there. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of people uh, work with telecom providers, someone like Level 3, who has a point of presence in, in Moscow and also has a traditional CDN service. Um, but this doesn't solve the problem either. A lot of e-commerce, especially these day applications, are dynamic transactions that happen real-time, personalized for this particular shopper or that particular shopping cart engine or this particular um, you know, hotel booking. Um, the, none of that content can get cached, and caching does not solve uh, this uh, particular problem um, you know, in the marketplace. So what do we do? Um, we, uh, what we do is use, leveraging our 140 points of presence, and again, 13 points of presence in Russia, um, we have we locate our servers, our software, very near your end users, wherever they may be, and then uh, we we put another point of presence or have a point of presence near your data center, um, whether it's your data center is located in in Frankfurt or San Jose or New York um, or London, um, and what we do is we we create a secure tunnel, a fast secure tunnel between our point our point of presence, um, and. Uh, of course, cacheable content like your logos and JPEGs and, and video images are stored very near your end users so they can get direct access. And even your dynamic transactions um, uh, are sped through our kind of highway or our tunnel uh, between um, your data center, wherever it's located, and uh, your end users. So our advice to customers are, is don't open new data centers. Don't expand your infrastructure. We, we have already done so. And we've actually created a kind of a next generation internet over, over the public internet through our infrastructure. So cacheable content gets uh, cached, uh, spread, uh, spread uh, to end users really quickly, and your dynamic calls um, uh, are sped through as well. And it's a fully managed service, 
and uh, we route around issues just like we mentioned before. When there are issues, we take a different path um, through our network. So what does this actually mean? I, I've delved a lot into the technology. So this is a single object, so a single object that, um, that we tested um, within, within uh, um, I forget where the exact origin on this was, in the US, um, and uh, measured through, uh, through Russia. Um, this, was, this single object was taking, on average, about 490 milliseconds um, to load. Um, uh, and we use a third-party measurement tool called Gomez that, uh, that measures this. And through our, through our network and through our services, we were able to get that single object down to 68 milliseconds. So it's a 600% improvement, 621%. So again, a single website or application, let's just say, has 30 different objects. Um, we can vastly reduce uh, the load time for that object, making your investment, your web business, usable from unusable. More on our Russia Acceleration Service. Um, this is another third-party uh, uh, measurement tool service called Sodexis, and what they do is they have um, uh, agents or measurement agents all throughout uh, actually running on end users' PCs, and um, they specifically me uh, measured in the Russian Federation. And uh, CD Networks is the number one, is the fastest uh, um, provider out there. So when when uh, objects are tested or websites are tested. Um, you can see some of the other players listed there. Um, again, having those points of presence in our technology makes us, uh, allows us to get, provide our customers the faster, fastest experience. Some other um, same charts, um, taking another single object, and this particular thing is uh, uh, from a San Jose origin um, and measured from different Russian cities. And you can see that the CD Networks line is almost covering the zero line, which is a, a very good thing. Um, that means that uh, you know um, your your web content gets out there very quickly. Um, our Russia Acceleration Service also includes our cyber. Uh, there's also a service that we uh, our cloud security offering, where th leveraging our our network, we're able to. Uh, shield or protect our customers from different types of DDoS and web application firewall attacks. Um, so on the left-hand side, without our security service, um, the attackers and the different botnets or uh, attack uh, PCs uh, will, will go after the um, website or, uh, or retail site or financial web application and, uh, again, inundate it with, uh, um, uh, with traffic and basically bring it down. And you'll see on the bottom there are different types uh, you know, of attacks uh, that uh, they provide or they can attack with. With us, um, what we do is we put our infrastructure in front of our, our customer's um, uh, application, and we go ahead and absorb, we detect, and then we defend uh, different types of attacks, um, you know, keeping our, our, our customer's applications up and running. Um, and valid requests, of course, are, fil uh, are filtered through and allowed to, to complete. All right, so let's, let's take a look at a couple of our case studies of actual customers. So we can always talk about internet and technology, but really it comes down to how does it improve our customers' web businesses. So uh, Archer Daniels Midland is, uh, is one of our customers, uh, is one of the largest agricultural processes in the world. Um, they're based in Illinois, and they, manuf they operate processing, manufacturing facilities, offices around the globe, okay? And they were experiencing um, issues with, with one of their um, uh, internal applications. And this particular, uh, again, Gomez chart shows that um, without us, um, for a single object, it was taking about 2.5 seconds for the single object to load um, you know, within, uh, within Russia. And we got that down to uh, 0.3 seconds for that object, so a, a, a significant reduction uh, in, in uh, load time, uh, vastly allowing their applications to actually function. Okay. Another case study, Bear Paints, um, again, a uh, larger supplier of, of paint and exterior wood care products in the U.S. and the globe. Um, so uh, uh, they're a subsidiary of Masco Corporation and, Corporation and they're headquartered here in California. Um, 
they actually wanted to get their their this look nice looking web application. So it's it's again not not a brochure where it's a very interactive kind of website or web application uh, to uh, their global end users, their global partners as well. Um, same type of results, particularly in Russia. Um, uh, a single object was taking uh, 2.3 seconds, and we got that down to 0.3 seconds. And so again, adding all that those different objects up together, we're seeing uh, uh, significant uh, performance improvements. Okay, so summing it all up, uh, specifically on the internet and to the do's and don't do. Um, do partner with, with a trusted organization. So uh, obviously uh, the USRBC, um, who uh, are represented here, um, they know this space very well. So you should absolutely partner with them. Um, and uh, partner with folks that know this particular market very well, this evolving market very well. Do partner with a global CDN, uh, like CD Networks, um, again, that are experts in, in this particular market and experts on delivering um, in, into the space, protecting our customers um, and, and all of that. Do invest in professional translation, uh, websites and marketing materials. One thing that we found is, sure, you could launch your website in English, um, but once you, uh, Russians are uh, somewhat like the French, very proud of the language and want to uh, see things in, in their native tongue. So translation and uh, you know, um, changing the user experience specifically for this market is very, very imp important. So don't forget, speed matters. So you, you, even if you go ahead and do your translation and change your user, user X, uh, UXD uh, design and launch your, your site, if it takes 40 seconds to load, it, it will not be accessed. Okay, and again, we, we've seen customers come to us in, in this kind of state. Um, uh, do adapt your online advertising and search engine uh, optimization campaigns and, and, and management campaigns for Russian, popular Russian platforms. This is important. Um, uh, do establish specific Russian customer service functions. Again, language speaking, local experts uh, on the, in this particular market. Um, don't assume e-commerce conversion rates be on par with developed markets, okay? Um, with all of the existing challenges on trust and confidence and payments and, and th different things that, like that, um, it may, may take a little slower, but this market cannot be ignored. It is too, too massive, too growing, and uh, again, our, uh, many of our smarter customers are, are already investing uh, 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 a lot into the space. And in fact, a lot of them are actually using the Russian market as, again, a leapfrogging opportunity to get out of the, um, uh, the, the, the red ocean um, and go after untapped markets. Um, and do investigate and offer multiple payment options. Again, going with uh, the existing cash kiosk today as an immediate short term, but also working on uh, uh, digital payments and digital wallets of, of the future. 